tea. And just a reminder that after afternoon tea, there won't be a session in here. We'll all be in the big room. Um, but for now, we have one more juicy intellectual snack before afternoon tea. Um, and uh, I'm not going to tell you this person's name because this person is very excited about all of the different subjective ways that we can uh, refer to people. I'm just going to say, wicked brain, you're in for a great talk. Thanks, Misha. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, a lot of people call me Mix. Uh, this is also my ID. Um, and there's a Twitter ID there as well if you would really like to find me. So I'm going to talk to you today about embracing subjectivity, uh, and hoping to cover uh, three things. So a little bit about my perspective on the trajectory of the web uh, and where that's come from, some basic primitives for building in decentralized technology, and finally, a new hope for the future. So to, to understand our trajectory on the web, I want to zoom back to uh, a little bit to look at where we've come from. So how, how is it that we've got to where we are today as a civilization? Um, I think there are a lot of things that go into this. Uh, you can't just instantly have sweet aqueducts, temples, vibrant economy, and cultural and scientific uh, development. Um, and what I'm going to there are, there are a lot of factors going into this, but what I'm going to focus on is the sort of organizational layer of this, because I think it's influencing the, the uh, web a bunch. So what do I mean by a sort of organizational layer? I'm kind of talking about admin. So humans have been doing transactions for quite a while. This is a transaction from about 5,000 years ago in Sumeria. It's a clay tablet. It's kind of a table. It's kind of maybe one of the earlier immutable logs. Um, and it, it's just some people trading barley or something. Um, we're all, we've also been into recording a bunch about taxes, because taxes are a really important uh, way to redistribute resources and build really awesome things. This is the Rosetta Stone. It's a tax edict from about 2,000 years ago. Um, and if we zoom forward a little bit, we're now using computers to manage a bunch of logistics. This is a Univac 1100 and was used in the 70s by uh, NATO to coordinate the movement of resources and pay around Europe. Um, actually, further afield than that, my father worked on one of these uh, in Germany. And the, the, interestingly, the techs, the, the technical people maintaining these had, were given the equivalent status of something like a bird kernel, like one below a general, so that nobody messed with the nerds. Um, and if you did mess with the nerds, the nerds would send your payroll to Vietnam, which was just a total administrative nightmare for you, because <laughs> you wouldn't have any spare spending money. So it's kind of like a dark foreshadowing. Um, we've also been into recording uh, other aspects of our lives, so things like identity. This is me. Or is it? You know, um, I've introduced. I might have introduced myself as Mix, but this asserts that my name is John Alistair Irving. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, writing this talk actually got me thinking quite a lot about, like, to what degree has the state rolled, uh, has the state played a role in the formation of identity? Uh, but rabbit hole. So I'll leave it there. Uh, other interesting things to notice are that um, some of these fields are fairly prescriptive. There's uh, this thing sex on here is male, presumably what, I guess that's fairly prescriptive. Maybe it's only allowed to be male and female. Um, so a bunch of this is like, so there are all of these opinions rolled into things like a document like this or in the way that we record our records or our payroll or our tax. And I'm going to argue that this is about institutional legibility, as in to make something big and complex and coordinate big and complex things, you kind of might need to have some opinions and simplify things a little bit sometimes. You need to, have, you need to be able to code forms, for example, uh, and those forms have to have 
particular properties or that, you, that you're going to expect and allow for you to be able to process things. So for example, if I wanted to change the name that was shown on my passport, uh, these are two of the forms at least that I would have to fill in. On the left is a DIA form, it's nine pages long. And on the right is a passport name change form, which is 12 pages long. Um, and institution, institutional legibility is kind of interesting or disturbing. Like, for example, this is not institutionally legible. Smiling, I used to take, I took photos of pa people's passports, uh, for people's passports at one stage for about a year. And nobody looks good when they're like taken in this aspect. Um, so yeah, lots of opinions kind of forces us into a, like, a bit more homogeneity, which, which um, can be problematic. So if we start to like, think about the, ro the role that code programming and the web has played in this, it's just really an extension of uh, a bunch of all of the opinions that were already baked into bureaucracies and paperwork. Um, so for example, if I'm setting up a database table, uh, I have to have opinions, right, about the fact that usernames have to be unique. I have to have opinions about maybe, like, you, you have to, you have to, this is a little bit contrived, but here I'm asserting that um, a person has to have a gender. They can't not have a gender. Uh, it turns out in New Zealand you can. They've, there are three options. There's M, F, and X, which is some fun reading if you want to go and check that out. It's pretty cool. So. Uh, I kind of want to blame this guy. I could go for a bit of a rant about objectivity on him, but we don't have time. Um, he sort of introduced a bunch of objective truth, uh, or the, sort of a concept of objective truth, this idea that there, there, there are these transcendental truths which might exist outside of uh, just people's opinions, and that you could access those or perhaps like approach them. Uh, and that's done quite a lot for the world. It's, great. it's been great for sort of the formation of science. But it can be dangerous when you start to have uh, rigid forms that you're building uh, or opinions that you're building into systems such that people might start to mistake this for my actual identity. Um, is this my identity? Is this objectively me? Uh, taken to its extremes, uh, objectivity can go fairly pear-shaped. This is a bunch of Christians lynching some Protestants in France sometime based on some strong opinions they read about in a book. So what's an alternative to this? Um, well, if we look at the op opposite of sort of objective truth, we could maybe have a look at subjectivity or subjective truth, and that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of um, this session. So subjectivity is also problematic. If you wind subjectivity all the way to its extreme, it's kind of silly and it gets into sort of nihilism. Um, or just people saying things and being like, I'm allowed my opinion. Um, but I'm interested in um, what maybe sort of a, a little bit of a happier medium ground, which is like humans have been telling stories around campfires for millions of years probably. And there's a bunch of truth and meaning and sort of recording um, of meaning which happens in this context. And it has its own problems as well. Um, for a long time, people thought the world was flat because it was a sort of, um, that was the consensus. Most people agreed with it and that was the emergent truth. But um, emergent truth can be quite interesting and powerful. So. Uh, Intersubjectivity is like a term that uh, is referred to in philosophy sometimes where you've got, there's like an individuals which have a subjective truth and if you sort of combine individual subjective truths with the idea of like a social graph, you can get this inter or sort of between uh, subject tru subject subjective truth. So contrasting this to the other sort of um, recording that we're seeing as a major trend over the last thousands of years, this sort of truth or meaning is not as institutionally legible. So 
as a thought experiment, what would it be like to build something like a subjective Twitter? A place where anyone can speak any tr anything that they want. They, it doesn't need to be like fit into a particular field on a form. And anyone can interpret however they interpret that however they want. So, spoiler, uh, we, we built it already. Here's what it looks like. This is Scuttlebutt. It's pretty much a fully decentralized Twitter. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a bunch about how it was built and then come back and look at some more examples. But first, like, what is Scuttlebutt? Scuttlebutt is kind of some archaic nautical slang for gossip. Um, but the reason we went for the name gossip is that the way that the way that information is passed in this context is very much similar to the way that people pass information in this context. Um, it's kind of by word of mouth. You chat to people you know. You remember some things of, from people you follow or who you care about. And then you could relay it to, uh, to other people who are also mutual friends of that person. So in Scuttlebutt, um, anyone can say anything that they want. And what's interesting is that um, we've built a bunch of different there's, we've built a bunch of different interfaces or ways of interpreting that uh, on top of this sort of shared discourse gossipy layer. So for example, uh, what you were just looking at was actually just called Patch Bay. Um, and that's kind of like Twitter and Facebook. There are also other ways of looking at this that I'll introduce you to a little bit later. There's Patchwork. Um, we've also got a GitHub built on top of this. We'll talk about how that's done. There's a DNS thing, a SoundCloud thing, and a Spotify thing. So we're going to talk about a few of the primitives needed to build up this technology, look at some example message types, and then um, as we're doing that, look at some of the apps and how they're used. So some decentralized or decentralization sort of primitives. The first one is content addressable storage. The second is public and private keys. So with content addressable storage, um, hands up if you use GitHub. Hands up if, keep your hands up if you've seen that number that is the red in the thing. Hands up if you know what that is. OK, um, there's a couple of people who don't. Um, just to go over it, it's the unique identifier of that particular commit. Uh, it's called, I guess it's called the commit ID. I actually don't know what it's called. But what's interesting about it is it is a unique name for that particular commit or the files in that commit. And this uses the idea of a hash. So with a hash, there's this concept that you can take a file, perform some sort of function on it, and produce something that is a much shorter, unique identifier for that thing, kind of like a fingerprint is for me. So it looks kind of like that. You take any file or any string or whatever, give it to the special function, and it produces that super long ID. So this has two really uh, excellent properties. One of them that's probably most common is if you're wanting to download like an Ubuntu ISO or something and you want to verify that none of, none of the content was corrupted and transfer, you can pull the file down, run the hash on it, and it will generate this unique fingerprint. If any, any of the data inside there happened, uh, happened to have been changed, either maliciously or um, accidentally, the fingerprint that comes out is not the same. So you can use it to verify that the content that you thought you were getting is actually the content that you've got. The second way that you can use this is if you have the fingerprint, as in if you have my fingerprint, you could ask anyone in this room, could somebody get me the person with this fingerprint? So you can use it in, the other, like, in, a, in a way to fetch a, or request a person. So in this way, um, we can get around needing to, so this is where content addressable storage comes in. Instead of having to put something at scuttlebutt.nz slash some ID, we can just, this, any content that we host could live anywhere, and we can uniquely fetch it by its fingerprint or by its hash ID. 
So the next concept is public-private keys. They have a couple of uses. Um, so, oh, this is... I was tempted to go for another, like, super ancient uh, example, but uh, I think this is pretty interesting. Japan still uses these things called hanko, and if you move to Japan, you'll be issued with this unique stamp, which uh, has your name in it, and it's the way that all bureaucratic documentation is signed by people. So if you lose your stamp, you're pretty screwed. Um, and and you, can't, you can't get a bank account, for example, without one of these things. So in this analogy, uh, the stamp represents the private key or a private, privately held piece of information which allows you to uniquely sign things. And the public part of this would be a... Um, the knowledge of the person's name, which is actually written in a stylized way into the stamp. Maybe there or maybe there. So this will be a person's name. And they can get unique enough because these, are, these things are like hand carved and they're, they have much, much more than 26 characters in their various alphabets. So they've got a huge degree of um, variability. Um, so uh, in coding, we have these public-private key pairs, and they're, they're actually mathematically linked, and we can sort of verify that they're connected. We'll look at this in some code in a moment. The second way that public-private keys can be used is to encrypt data. So um, briefly, we leave a public key out, as in the sort of knowledge of who I am, in, in the public domain, and anyone can take that key and use it to sort of scramble the text or content of something, and then it's called encrypted. And then myself, um, who is the only person who has the private key associated with that public key, can then use that key to decrypt or like sort of unscramble that document. So you can use this for sending private messages. All right, so what does this look like in our particular impl implementation in Scuttlebutt? So a uh, message in Scuttlebutt looks something roughly like this. It might have an author, which is me, and some content and a timestamp. Except we don't actually use uh, my name uh, at mix because there might be several mixes. So what we use is my public key. So this is the um, publicly available um, key that you might have seen at the start of my talk. So, uh, but this isn't enough to prove that this message necessarily was written by me. Uh, somebody could make an object and just put this key in it. That'd be, um, that wouldn't be hard to fake. The, ha the hard bit to fake is the concept of signing. So with, a, with the private key, or we can sort of combine the private key and the message to produce a signature, which is unique to this particular message. So it, the signature kind of, imagine it sort of stamping all over that object, uh, and it sort of has encapsulated it. So these things are sort of uh, mathematically linked, and you can prove that the person who owns this identity was the one that generated that signature. So that's, now we've got a signed message. We know that it's like definitely me who authored that. We now want to generate a unique identifier for this thing so that we can pass it and gossip it around uh, with friends. So we just hash the whole of this thing, also including the signature, and we have a unique ID for this thing now. Okay, so let's look at an actual example. Um, well, there might be a couple of details left out of this for sort of slide space reasons. Here's an about message. It's fairly similar to the last one. Um, it's got type about. It was authored by this person. They are, what they're actually doing is asserting um, a common use name of this person's public identity. So this person is asserting something about themselves and they're asserting that their name is Julia. So let's go have a look at what this message looks like on Patch Bay. So this is Juliana. Um, let's go look at another identity. So here's my friend Mikey. 
Um, the way that this interface is built is that it shows us all of the different assertions about this particular identity. So we can see that seven people have asserted this person is called Mikey. Um, I think I might have asserted this, na this person's name as our dinosaur, because that's his GitHub name, and that's what I'm more comfortable with seeing him as, or dinosaur I think I've got. Um, and I've also kindly asserted that his name is also Michael Williams, so that if his um, family ever get to the Scuttleverse, uh, they won't be freaked out by their son's face being stretched over someone called Dinosaur. Um, and there's the same, the same thing's true for all these images. You can have like watercolor Mikey, um, tramping Mikey, raving Mikey, pug Mikey, or like, Cocktail Mikey. <laughs> and these are all totally valid. So what's really cool is when I, when I want to author a message, I can use any of these, these um, aliases. So I can be like Mikey, or a dinosaur, or Michael. And these will all send a message to the same person. So. Uh, that's something that I really enjoy about Scuttlebutt so far. Um, worth mentioning that Patch Bay is a particular um, a particular way that the that the, the all of this information has been represented. Here's another representation. This is Patchwork Next. Uh, this is the same information displayed by that interface. You'll notice there's less names and less images. This is because the opinion of the person who wrote this was that we shouldn't show names which are no longer in use. Could be a good opinion. I don't know. Let's try it out. Uh, here's another example message. It's a post. Um, it's kind of similar to the first one we had, except it has a root message. So this is just an implementation where if you want to have the concept of a reply, you just point to another message that somebody said and then add some content, and then that's kind of like a reply. So I won't show an example of that. Here's another message type, or sort of what it looks like. Let's go and have a look at that. Um, this is git ssb, which is like GitHub built on Scuttlebutt. And git is basically just made up of a bunch of commit messages and some sort of like file blobs. So uh, all of this here is just um, just that, but um, gossiped amongst friends. So I'm friends with this guy called Ansys, and this is one of his repos. Here's Patchwork Next that I was showing you before. So we're building the system on the system, which is really exciting. Uh, let's look at another message type, issue. Uh, I don't have an example of this one. Uh, it's just GitHub issues implemented, so you can point at a repo and say, there's an issue uh, on this repo. Uh, but these, none, of, none of these message types were defined by a central committee. They're just sort of emerging, and their use is emerging. So I could do something super creative and fun, like point at Mikey and say, issue. I have an issue with you being represented as a pug. I don't think that's very... <laughs> Um, honest. <laughs> uh, we've also got music. This is this was made by um, Matt McKeg, who did uh, a talk uh, yesterday. Uh, he got sick of SoundCloud, and so he made Ferment. Um, so, coming back to this idea that there are all of these different messages, if you want like a super minimal interface to the Scuttleverse. Uh, which will run on a Raspberry Pi. You could try out this experimental thing called PatchFoo, and it only uses the post and like type messages. If you want something that's uh, super accessible, you can use Patchwork or Patchwork Next, which tends to use these ones more. Patch Bay is a little bit messier, but it um, also has Git integrated into it, so it's kind of like a hybrid of, uh, or it's trending towards a hybrid of Facebook and GitHub. I don't know if that's a good idea, we'll see. Um, Git SSB use a bunch of uh, Git related things plus a bunch of, it uses posting for replies on pull requests, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's, this is a music one which is like Spotify. I have no idea what it's using, um, and that's fine. 
So uh, there and back again. I think what's been most interesting for me is coming back to the old web. Like, what's it been like to, um, to have some experiences in a different space and then reflect on those and using the web? So the first one is pretty straightforward. It's connectivity. Very similar to the sort of campfire stories uh, that I remember hearing, all of the things that I gossip are stored on my hard drive. So I kind of have my database is just totally local. I don't have to deal with any of the slowness that some of the sort of HTTP2 stuff might address. Um, and um, I only store the information that's relevant to me. I've got like a two degrees um, reach of friendship that, I care, that we sort of count currently as uh, my sort of community. And currently, that takes up about 200 megabytes for all the uh, text and maybe two gigabytes for all the images. Uh, so it's my experience of using social media in this context is pretty much instantaneous. Um, further, the idea of being offline just doesn't exist. I'm either up to date and synced with everyone, or in the process of syncing, or um, that's it, really. Uh, I, use, I use this technology on planes. This is uh, Dominic Tarr and Dangerous Beans using it on the ocean. They just had a Wi-Fi network set up, and they're gossiping between boats. What's really exciting about this, though, is it doesn't need to just be boats. It can be any remote locations. You don't need to be near the backbone of the internet to be able to use this. So these boats could be ships that are in space. They could be uh, lunar bases. Um, you just can't do that with HTTP. Top-down UI, um, I, um, I was trying to manage my finances a little bit more responsibly recently, and uh, trying to understand the patterns in my spending, and there's, I just can't read walls of numbers. So I built this, I wanted to build this sort of spark line to show me the trends in my spending, and I couldn't because my bank um, doesn't have an API. So I built this web extension which scrapes the table and like jams a graph into the DOM, which works but feels really, really dirty and just wrong. Like I authored these transactions, or at least I played a role in them, right? So like, why would you block me from making this? If you want this extension, you can go get it there. Um, Unique names, like, OK, Mix is a slightly unique name. But if you went with, uh, if my name was Dave, and, it, and an interface is like, sorry, we already have a Dave in this club room, that's just, that's just stupid. Like, it's a, bad, it's a bad architecture that would lead you to need to behave in that way. Um, papers, please. So, Having, having to log in every time you want to do everything, anything is kind of interesting. Um, I'll be having a conversation online, and then we'll try and move into a different space and be confronted with this sort of like pat down. And it's just like, why can't I? I'm used to being able to have a conversation. It feels like having a conversation with a friend around a fire or something. And um, all of a sudden, this security person steps in to check stuff. And it's like, what are, you, what are you so paranoid about? Oh, oh, you're worried about my data, you losing control of my data. Hmm. Um, I guess that extends to sort of border control more generally. If we want to move between different platforms, like I'm on Slack, but we're wanting to discuss something about GitHub and also have a collaborative doc going, it's just a pain in the ass, because every time you move between different domains, it's like, oh, um, I, what was my login for this thing? Um, hmm. And the, the, the concept of the social graph is not the same in each location. It's sort of, that's a guarded thing. Um, so um, whether I'm sort of like Frodo leaving Middle Earth or whether we're sort of heading for a climate apocalypse, or whether we're going to Mars, I just don't think the internet 
on its current trajectory is really going to serve us. So if anyone would like to come and join us in the Scuttleverse, you're most welcome. Um, you can find out some more information at scuttlebutt.nz. Um, once you get online, that's my uh, public key. And thank you very much. Cool. So it is 3.10, which is officially the beginning of uh, the afternoon break. Um, but I'm sure Mix is happy to stick around and answer questions if you want to hang out in this.